Welcome back to their EFMP story. Um, we have today um, our executive director and founder, Michelle Norman. We're really excited to have you today and to chat about your experience. Um, I know a lot of people are already familiar because that's kind of how you started Partners in Promise is sharing your story um, with not only your community in Virginia, but also with the military community. Yep. Um, what a journey you've had over the past year. So I don't even know where to begin um, with what, you know, we could jump right into your advocacy or we could jump into your, you know, story, but let, let's start with you, your family. You know, we were very much in a fight or flight situation for a long time to make sure that our daughter first can breathe on her own. And then we could concentrate on the bigger things of her having cerebral palsy, you know, getting her to, to eventually walk and to eat on her own because she still had an NG tube and um, all those things that kids are doing very early, like my son at a year, year and a half, and she was so delayed, but we never gave up. And so she's lived a life of therapists that have come to the house, you know, very early on. Um, she went through, you know, early intervention with this public school district to also continue some of that. She ended up walking at, you know, 31 months. And so she started eating, you know, on her own, probably at about two years. And so things were met just very, very delayed. And for any other parent out there who's experienced that delayed, I'll tell you, I've never cried so much to see a, a child walk when other people maybe take it. I, I remember my son walked at like 10 and a half months. He's like, this is blowing my mind. You know, it wasn't the same as it was to finally see her walk, you yeah. know, it just, yeah. you know, it just, um, and then that's the other thing about the special needs community too, is just understanding and valuing those moments, you know, it's just so special to us that we don't take it for granted. And for her first birthday, she was still home, um, getting ready for that big surgery. So we didn't want anyone kind of like COVID, you know, we didn't want anyone to see her, you know, we didn't want anyone to get her sick. And I'll never forget BFA 34, they would come every hour. My girlfriend, Annalise, set it up, and, and Kristen, and uh, every hour on her birthday, they were dropping something off at her front door. You know, or it was just the sweetest, sweetest thing. So that military spouse community, just so important to connect with, no matter where you are on this journey, um, because they, they really want to help. And sometimes, you know, it's uncomfortable for us to say, this is what I need, but you kind of need to say, yeah. I need this, I need that, you know, because I think for us, we're very self-sufficient as a family, and that was very hard to ask for help. Yeah. Really, really hard to ask for help. Um, and when we did need, it just, people need to realize that there are so many in the community that that's what they just want to, yeah. uh, the goodness of their heart. They just maybe need a little direction. So and definitely And also the, the model of military um, have that, stone face of showing strength is that is something that is a tradition but it's something that is move, we're moving away from that um in leadership and and recognizing the humanity that's you know you don't just have to be that strong face um you can be a, a person <laughs> a normal human being who has needs and has to ask for help and that's and so there's wonderful you know organizations like the navy marine corps Relief society that are there um, for these, you know, events that you couldn't plan for. Yeah. Um, and they were able to help us out. So I'm always a big, big fan of them. And I always um, tell our families that if you ever get in a rut, that's where you need to go. Yeah, there's tons of resources. So just that connection to, that, to your community can point you towards those resources that are often hard to find at first. Exactly. So that was kind of the start of our advocacy, really. Um, you know, it's just a lot of medical, a lot of therapy. Um, and then she got into school and that was a whole new journey for us as far as education goes you know we got to a great point in the medical world i wasn't really anticipating um any challenges you know with the education as much um i think we were just so happy that she was in school and she was yeah. you know meeting some of these milestones you know so anytime you know, teachers would say, she's doing so great, and da, da, da. You're like, yes, thank you. I've been wanting to listen and hear this for years. You want to win. You want you that want win. To. Yeah. You want that win. You want everyone to love your kid. Yeah, you can relax for a minute. <laughs> exactly. I think you do want to have that time of just, like, laying low and, mm -hmm. and just seeing your child do what her peers are doing, sort of, kind of, you know, even though she yeah. was still paid. The fact that she was even in that setting was, like, a win to us. And so... 
you know, we were very naive in the beginning and, and, you know, didn't question a lot of things on the educational journey and her IEP and took a lot of, you know, wonderful, wonderful staff and teachers that loved her and, and wanted to see her do well. Um, but I think we were definitely naive on what she was entitled to. Mm -hmm. um, How, what is your, what was your light bulb moment when it came to the education piece? Like <laughs> that there's something is wrong. I mean, is it still the same as, as when you connect back to your memories of the medical piece where there's that gut, is yeah. it the same kind of feeling or was there something more concrete? No, it was definitely the same type of feeling. You know, I think that um, we've moved so much and we had really good experiences um, initially here in Virginia Beach when she was in pre-K, she had met all these milestones. It was a very happy time. We moved to Newport, Rhode Island um which had great resources there i mean just fantastic um and came back and then went back to pentagon we were kind of floating around i think it's just you know the, the nature of my husband's job and um, we were dealing with some other medical issues so we didn't really focus as much on education as we should have i would say it was probably when we left fairfax county because she was doing so well there and getting a lot of support and then we came to virginia beach in 2014 where that just those initial interactions kind of set out some some red flags you know the fact that um you know when we got here and i'd already sent the iep ahead of time as we always recommend and um, no one had seen the iep when we started conversing with them um and then they were switching teachers the very you know even two days prior to school starting the new teacher hadn't seen the iep the very first couple of days marissa came home anxious and um, I can tell from the work that was coming home nothing was modified I mean nothing was being followed on the IEP and um, seeing my daughter you know and how she was reacting to it that that concerned me because we had such you know good um, experiences previously and so when you see your child struggling so early on yeah. even with the fact that they changed teachers at the last it just our kids need routine and structure, and there wasn't that happening, in her, even though her IEP was there. Um, I have a question related to this. Yeah. And so for, for our families who maybe haven't had that positive experience, what would you pull away from this as your red flag so that families could see that maybe I'm not really, maybe what I think is a good situation, it maybe isn't? Is there, some, is there something you could pull out of it if you hadn't had that really positive experience that we could share with families? Or is it something just that goes back to the gut? <laughs> I think it was the gut and just seeing the disorganization, you know, of, of the staff and those who are gonna be responsible for delivering her education. That concerned me. Um, and it's so funny because I immediately, when I saw some of this happening, like first couple of days, like I'm very happy to come in and volunteer <laughs> in your classroom because it seems like maybe you need some, some help, you know? And that's, I wanted it to be a positive time. Like, hey, can I come in and help with any, you know, putting packets together or whatever it might be. Let's, do we need to go over the IEP? You know, it just, yeah. I feel like- um, Starting you know, from a point of collaboration. Yeah. Yeah always start with collaboration you know they, they started taking the existing IEP from Fairfax and moving some things around that I was not aware of initially was a problem you know there were things that were under the related services box they're like oh yeah here in Virginia Beach we put those under accommodations and I'm like okay you know and you still have OT and PT on there I'm like okay but it turns out that that's really not what you do you don't move things out of a service into accommodations because once they did that it decreased the amount of time that she had and it also um, was more of a consult versus her getting two or three times a week of something. So it was a really big deal. And there were other things that were changed that um, initially didn't want to cause any waves mm -hmm. and didn't really know about, you know, what I was supposed to be asking for at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was naive, I was ignorant and we we're like, okay, that, sure, that's fine. We'll, we'll go ahead and go forward with some of this. Um, but that's when I had to say, okay, maybe I need to be doing some more research. That's when I started looking at rightslaw.com, you know, what is IDEA, what are my daughter's rights, what is, what's supposed to be in an IEP? 
Um, and that's when the, that's when we started digging. And when you start digging, that's when it starts to get like, wow, you know, I didn't even realize this. <laughs> I didn't realize that she was supposed to have, you know, X, Y, Z, or you could sign something in partial consent. And, you know, there were so many things that we were just, you know, naive about. And um, I didn't, you know, we just came back to the school district. I didn't want to cause that many waves. Mm -hmm. You know, I want my daughter to be happy. I have a son there now. And um, there were some, there were some tough times and, you know, just seeing her stressed out and not happy and knowing that things weren't um, being followed and implemented on our IEP. I knew at that point I had to step up, you know, and, you know, find an advocate and then start having some, some more difficult conversations with the school. So when you um, look back and obviously we're talking your experience can be probably shared with the civilian community at this point, you know, what the medical experience up to special education and dealing with IDEA. Um, when we look at the military specific component, um, what, were, what military uh, resources were you possibly aware of or were able to utilize when we cross over into that EFMP uh, world? What was that like? I know, um, what, especially when you're doing it a lot, you know, now a little while back, what services are different possibly now? I mean, what was the situation? <laughs> really? What um, did you even know that you had? You know, did you have any? Yeah, I think when I looked back on EFMP at the time, I always thought it, it was more of a, in a um, assignment tool. Like EFMP is there for you depending on where you're going to go next on your base. I didn't know that they had other family you know, help resources, um, yeah. resources in that respect. I, I didn't, I thought was, this is mainly for making sure we can go to the right place that can meet the needs of your EFMP child. Um, so I actually first, you know, reached out to the parent liaison for the school district. Didn't realize that that parent liaison was paid by the school district. And so there was definitely a conflict of interest as far as what we were saying as family and what the rest That's of the- school liaison officer? Or like the military exactly. a parent liaison. Oh, so it's a, not, um, not the same. Okay. No, I just want to same. clarify. Okay, <laughs> I was like, what? I didn't. I thought they were paid by the by the <laughs> right okay. place to start. I needed help. I was a parent. Yeah. Like, ah, the parent liaison. Um, but she came to a few meetings, and that wasn't really super helpful as well. Um, we also contacted the Virginia Department of Education because I didn't know where to go, and you know, spoke to some lovely people there but they felt like their hands were tied and really pushed it back to, you know, the, the local education agency, which is the school district. Um, and then uh, we also, I, really, I don't think I, I think I did some maybe research online for EFMP to see if they had any advocates and they didn't. I did reach out to school liaison officer who said they could not help with anyone with IEPs. Um, that wasn't their job. Um, so my husband reached out to the local JAG just to say, hey, you know, do y'all have any resources? And like, this is not in our wheelhouse. We don't have anyone that works on those type of specific um, problems with special education. So we really did feel like we were on our own at that time, as I imagine many other EFMP families did at the time. There were not really any resources. And again, I started doing my research. I had my, you know, book on rights law, emotions to advocacy. I'm like, yeah, you know, and I'm like talking about things. I had it highlighted. It doesn't really matter if the whole team, I felt like there's a gaslight that was happening. It's like, yeah, but we interpreted this and it did this way. And I'm like, but this is, it says this. And until so you can have people that have authority that people will listen to, I felt like, you know, our, you know, concerns were minimized in a lot of ways. Um, and so that's when we felt, and I was stressed, you know, it was me and 16 other people in a room and I felt, you know, somewhat bullied to not agree. Was it just you or did you have an advocate or did you hire someone? Initially it was just me. Initially it's been me. And there's been many IAP meetings where it was just me. Um, and it's, I have taken, you know, Marissa's godmother with me once. She told me, and she's an engineer and she works for a big company. She's like, it's one of the most stressful meetings I've ever been to in my entire life. And so I'm like, yeah, imagine having 15 or 16 of these a year. It just, anyone who's been in one that you don't agree with everything, it just, it's, it's hard. You know, it's hard on a family. 
especially so when you're the reason. Other military struggles it's you know you add in those compounding factors with the military where you're worried about the safety of your loved ones you're dealing with the deployment you have maybe other children and and you just want it to to be resolved sometimes so so what really other than yeah, obviously you're not a person who just wanted it to go away so so <laughs> once you found these struggles you know what was your next thought process and how did you and Cass kind of come together and make a choice about how to proceed? I think it was the fact that I was so stressed out and I was having a hard time managing the house um, alone with the kids when he was gone. We both came to the decision that I needed someone beside me in these meetings. You know, I needed an advocate and um, just for my mental health, you know, and just to kind of make sure, are we, are we, you know, are we insane or are we, you know, well, do we understand what IDA is and what, it, what my child is afforded through it? And so we, we made some hard decisions. We we've had to have help from family and other resources to pull on it because advocates are not cheap. Um, and we found an advocate locally. And when we presented our case, and this is what happened when we moved here, and all these things are being taken away and removed from the IEP, they're saying this, we know that. Um, and she's like, oh, wow, you, you, there's some issues here. <laughs> Lots of issues. Um, and she started coming to some meetings. And unfortunately, you know, they became contentious. You know, once you start bringing someone in who is challenging, um, you know, a group of 15 people around the table, it there was really no win-win in it. You know, I, it was kind of going downhill as far as they said one thing, we were saying another. Um, and she got to a point, you know, after we kept trying to work with them, I can't tell you how many meetings we've had. Um, it got to a point where we knew that we we're gonna have to take it to the next level. There's only so much an advocate can do, mm -hmm. but you really need to, if you know that there's no middle ground, you need to get an attorney. Yeah, that's what our next step. And she even suggested to us the advocate, like, I can't go any further. You're going to have to get an attorney. Yeah. And so that really was the stickler after the first year. Yeah, we didn't want to go there. No. Um, you know, based on the testing that we had and what we had seen from her year of regression academically and socially in that public school year, we pulled her out. We had found a private school that was um, for kids with learning differences that seemed to be able to meet the needs that she had. And so we gave them 10 days notice to say, we're pulling her from public, we're putting her in private. Let's work together on this, you know, and see if we can come up with a, you know, solution on it, but they refused. And so we put her in that private school and we kept working with the school district for an additional year. Um, we knew we needed to have a lot more updated testing because a lot of the testing was outdated. So um, when you so say you put her into the um, private school, did you pay for that out of your own pocket? Did you ask the school district to pay at that point or so that you were paying we, for it? And we had hoped that they would work with us and um, place her there, but that was not happening. And so we did have to, again, <laughs> um, lots of wonderful family and borrowing of money to be able to put her into that private school. And then we kept working with the public school um, for an additional year. And in some cases when the IEP can't be met, it is an option for families to be placed in, in other school districts within the area that can meet the needs of the services. So, but obviously that's with a more cooperative school district, right? So if the needs cannot be met in the public school district, um, the IEP team should be able to come to that conclusion that there is one that could. Mm -hmm. um, but they were still in belief that the public school with the way that they presented the IEP would meet all of her unique needs. Um, and we disagree. But one of the good things about IDA is that you can request for an IEE um, if you don't agree with the results from the school testing. And um, clearly we thought that the, the speech testing that was done was not as in depth and we just, it needed more, it needed more. And that's when we found out about the auditory processing, found out that there could be hearing loss. Um, and then we saw an audiologist and sure enough, she did have hearing loss in the right ear. So there's just so many things that were kept How old, is, how old was Marissa at this time? She was 12. So and it, it was still like learning new things. And that's the thing, it evolves. You know, I think 
why did we not see this when she was younger? Well, it could be the speed of how she was learning things, how third graders, fourth graders were learning things. But when you get to fifth grade, things are going a little faster. And that's why I always tell people, it's, it's, it, these IEPs have to be reflective of how they change over time. And you have to keep having, if you suspect something, you know, testing all the time to make sure you're on top of things. Um, and so when these things kept popping up, there really were no changes to the IEP to try to have interventions on how to help her. And they want to keep throwing some more accommodations in. But really, you can teach these kiddos um, how to, to work with auditory processing. And how and, many, if, I mean, I know we could go into each and every one, but how, how many um, key trials have you, do process hearings have you had to deal with? And well, I, up to that point, none. <laughs> so we filed for due process in 2016. Um, and we won, and that's pretty rare. Um, typically, school districts win about 95% of the time, and parents win very, obviously, only 5% of the time. And if you don't have any representation, you might as well forget it. So we were fortunate to find Grace in Northern Virginia because there's really, there were no special education attorneys here in Hampton Roads, none. You just have to be prepared, in, in when you do have an attorney, be prepared that if one day anything's gonna go to due process, and be prepared that you may not be able to speak at your own due process. And so make sure, making sure you have all your documentation just right so that anyone could pick it up and go, okay, this tells a story of what happened without the mom speaking. You know, I would suggest for any parent not to take calls, um, mm -hmm. take them a voicemail and then have Good it- practice through. for anything like this. Because <laughs> <laughs> it turns out, you know, it's a he said, she said thing. And so just do it through email. You know, that way you have that paper trail of, you know, you said Johnny needed X, Y, Z. Well, great. Put that in an email. And if you had to have that conversation. Grab a recording oh. device and tell them you're recording. Exactly. <laughs> there are free recording devices on all apps have them. Just, yes, do it. It's so easy, you know, because you, like you said, it's right on the, I, the iPhone. And if you are stopped in like the hallway of the school, if you pick up your daughter or son, you go back home, write the email, say, it was so great to see you in the hallway. You know, from our conversation, this is what I gathered, yeah. X, Y, Z. And then if they don't reply, then I guess that's what happens. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of make sure that everything um, is, is documented, documented because that information is actually very important. So we won in 2016. They appealed to the federal court. We won again in 2018. There were numerous state complaints in between that we had to file since they were not following the decisions. Then they stopped all support for our daughter and then they ended up suing her in um, Christmas time of 2019, 2000, sorry, 2018. And so there we are going to another due process hearing, but this time they were the ones that um, had to prove that they were providing a fate for our daughter to get her back out of private school into public school. So that was a little bit of a surprise for us because they've never sued a family before and nor have they, especially a military family. So, but then PBS NewsHour heard of our story and they did one in um, early 2019 before the trial actually happened. And that just got the ball rolling, I think. You know, like people didn't, even, didn't know that schools could, could sue a, a child, you know, it's, it's insane that it got to that level. Um, we ended up having the second trial at the end of March of 2019. And my husband left the next week um, for his geo bachelor assignment in, overseas. So. And then in May. And in May, we found out we won so again. <laughs> yeah, a new one. So, exactly. Well, that's right. During all that, you know, we had um, Armed Forces Insurance, Military Spouse of the Year. I was fortunate to, to win the title for Navy. And um, yeah, it just, it really started a lot of momentum. It really, we had done some congressional letters and requests through our local um, legislators when we were having problems initially back in 2017. And um, we kept some of those relationships. And I said, you know, we need to really look at this long and how do we make sure other families don't go through what we just went through and they're still going through. Um, and so we have, we started engaging with our local representative to try to get, you know, a study done on military families, especially no one really has studied, you know, what rate this is happening. You know, what is the scene of special education for our families? Is it good? Is it bad? 
no one's really collected that data. And so that was the first start of like, how do we solve this problem for everybody? Yeah. And that was, you know, approaching Representative Luria and said, can we get this into the NDAA? Because I think this is a bigger problem. And as families started hearing about our story, I was starting to get messages left and right from so many other families saying, this is my story. This exactly happened to me. They were waiting us out. They didn't, we were only here for two years or even one year. Um, they were not doing, they were not implementing the IEP. They were taking away services. My child didn't get transportation for six months. I had no recourse. And so we realized we were not alone and that there was like this unspoken challenge that no one, we were so tired and exhausted and stressed that none of us really came together and was able as a collective voice be able to say, these are our issues as EFMP families. Um, and then on top of that, no one really had a solution on how to help these families, right? Because it's supposed to be already be taken care of through federal law and then through state law. So why should we need to have a solution if it's already supposed to all be covered, you know, yeah. through these laws? So um, I think, you know, we started banding together, got some other military spouses to join us. A partners in Promise, you know, even though we weren't named or formed quite yet, we really started laying the foundation to talking about the situation, gathering some data, even though it was, you know, the bare minimums this last fall, but just really telling the stories was the first step. You know, here's four spouses, you know, at the Congressional Military Family Caucus Summit last, you know, October in Fort Benning, where me and Grace and Shannon and Casey came together and told our stories. And that in itself was super powerful because no one really understood these challenges before. Um, and that was very successful. We were approached by Congresswoman Morris Rogers right after that said, I, I hear you, I understand, it's personal to me as well. Um, how do we solve it? Draft legislation. Yeah. And so. <laughs> let's fix it, let's just not talk about it. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, it was, like um, <laughs> you know, that's something I do like every day, not. <laughs> It was a great challenge, though, to know that someone was listening and someone cared and understood the complexity of what we were dealing with. And we did. We, we sat down and we had a short turnaround, I think, of like two weeks, not even, not even three weeks. And we did. We, we came up with the Promise Act, which is protecting the rights of military children in special education. And it's about 12 initiatives that um, will safeguard and protect our military children's rights and also will um, help them as a PCS and ensure that they can, you know, be able to move from state to state and district just without losing, you know, their important pieces of their IEP. But then also looks a little bit into the accountability and transparency of the impact aid funding that comes in for our children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is the bigger picture here? You know, is there not enough funding? Do we need fully funded IDA, impact aid? How's that all working? But if you are getting funding, let's make sure it's not going to an attorney to sue families, but let's make sure it's actually going to the special ed, you know, students yeah. in a military family. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that, that was a big milestone for us. And it just kept going into 20. Yeah. It's still <laughs> happening. The ball it's is still cool. rolling and that's a great thing. I think that- It is, it is. That was really, um, we knew we were onto something when we started getting those data results from the MILSFED 2020 survey. Mm -hmm. And within 48 hours of over 200, you know, responses. Um, and then it, just getting those stories, we're like, this is definitely what we thought and what we assumed was definitely confirmed, you know, that it was happening in various locations. And many of these locations were very EFMP centric. And that was concerning to us is that these are areas that these service branches, you know, deemed appropriate because it does have um, medical resources that maybe no one really dug deep enough to, to look at the special education. You know, a lot of these spaces have fabulous general education schools, yeah. but that doesn't always equate to general education and then the special education is over here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it only takes a really quick look on the special, the Department of Education websites for each state to really see the data for special education. It's not good in a lot of places that we send a lot of our kiddos. I think that's one of the complexities of families who fall into EFMP is that there is no one size fits all. Um, exactly. And there is no, like, what's the least common denominator here? And, and, but reality is you can't just 
it's not necessarily going to be perfect. Like we acknowledge that they can't get it right every single time, but we can look at all the data points together. What do we need to be considering? Right. Um, and not every, you know, we can fix some things. We can't fix everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the, um, you know, a lot of that was echoed during our testimony in front of the Congressional House Armed Services Committee for last February, when we talked about EFMP and the challenges it is for families, you know, we talked about how it isn't one size fit all, but we need to at least have some type of standardization among all service branches so that when there are issues, you know what to do, how to go, all the resources should be the same um, to be able to, to give more tools for these families. Cause right now a lot of them are flailing. Yeah. Um, and are in locations that are not suitable for them. The success of the NDAA is collecting data about military family experiences in certain areas. And another area we're hoping to collect that is our survey mm. the upcoming year. It's exciting um, to see exciting. What, what the real experiences of our families are. Yeah, I'm really thrilled about that. You know, the bill that um, Representative Thornberry and Kelly came up with, 6489, all that went through into the draft for the NDA on the House side. The Senate side did an amazing job in putting some GAO studies in there that really deep dives into um, what's really happening at each of these bases. Um, and also the funding piece is, so we'll see what makes it through conference. Yeah. Um, I talked about having special education attorneys um, at bases, which I think is fantastic. So lots of good things in the yeah. NDAA. So I'm Definitely. really thrilled. If, if they're including um, EFMP in their executive summaries, it says a lot that this right. is the priority for both the House and the Senate. So, um, you know, I think as an organization, we're excited because we can see that there is that support. And I think that our voices are, speaking of voices, we have small people in this house all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but our voices are elevated and right now and it's important to keep sharing our stories and um i just feel very blessed to be a part of this community there's some amazing resilient strong families and i know that um we can learn a lot from each other and build each other up and advocate together for our families so thank you yeah thanks everyone and uh keep an eye out for more more stories coming <laughs>